Hello everyone, welcome to what's happening in Brazil. Let's start our show with the latest news from the country. The Free Land Camp, the country's largest indigenous mobilization, is going to take place from April 4th to 14th in Brazil's capital city, Brasilia. The event has 18 years of history. In 2022, an estimated 8,000 native people's representatives will attend the event to be held in person after two years of online editions. In this year's event, the attention goes to the governmental measures aiming to remove the rights of indigenous peoples, such as the bill to allow mining companies in indigenous lands. President Jair Bolsonaro supports this bill. The fight for land demarcation is also on the mobilization's agenda. Besides the protests and meetings, the activities promoted by the camp include an online plenary with the European Parliament and the United Nations. The delivery company iFood hired advertising agencies to demobilize the organization movement headed by delivery workers who demand rights. That's what was revealed by a news report published on an investigative journalism website. The accusations were made by former employees of these same ad agencies who took part in the campaigns. The actions started in mid-2020, when app delivery workers organized a day in which they stopped delivering to demand better work conditions. The advertising companies hired by iFood created fake social media accounts to demobilize the workers. In 2021, an undercover person even attended a delivery worker's demonstration and tried to divert the protest's aim. Food delivery services increased a lot during the pandemic, and the scenario of unemployment drove many people to search for work in delivery apps as an alternative to gain some money, although the terrible work conditions. According to a 2021 survey, 61% of the delivery workers work 7 days a week and 47% work more than 10 hours daily. For 10 years, Brazil has had a law that guarantees vacancies in universities for black, indigenous and disabled people. The quota law can be extended or amended by the country's Congress in 2022. The law supporters are united to debate adjustments and to face the parliamentarians who want to end racial quotas. In August 2012, President Dilma Rousseff sanctioned a law on racial quotas. From then on, universities and federal institutes should gradually direct 50% of its vacancies to students from public schools and, a part of this percentage, to black, indigenous and disabled applicants. One of the articles of the Racial Quota Law provides for its review after 10 years of the law's enactment, that is, this year. For this reason, dozens of bills were presented to Congress. They were wrote by the federal government's base against the quota policy, as well as the opposition that fights for its permanence. We propose to extend this law for 50 years and to create an Affirmative Actions Policy Council in the Ministry of Education. Also, we suggest creating a scholarship policy to support the quota students throughout the study years, because this is a real problem. For their turn, far-right congressmen such as Kim Kataguiri presented bills against the quota law. He believes the racial quotas caused a kind of division among Brazilians, because it offers what these politicians call differential treatment. Julio Oliveira Souza enrolled at the University of Brasilia as a quota student. She says there is a constant debate on the issue in her class of collective health and that she refutes the anti-quota arguments. It makes no sense because when we compare before the quota, just white and wealthy people had access to the University of Brasilia. It's crystal clear. I knew indigenous, quilombola and trans people at the university. Like most people, I do not spend time with these groups I mentioned in my daily life. 
but the university gave me this opportunity. However, the supporters of the law acknowledge that some issues still need to be solved. One of these issues concerns cases of fraud in the process of racial self-declaration caused by the lack of clear criteria on color and race definitions. Another issue is the lack of support for quota students. They are often unable to keep studying and end up quitting the university. Art can be a tool to promote mental health. In this episode of Culture Talk, we are gonna know initiatives that use drawing and painting to treat psychiatry disorders. To paint the unconscious, Edson's life took a new road when he started to create from dreams. His vibrant and colorful works on acrylic are part of the schizophrenia treatment. This disease causes a lot of pain and disturbances. Sometimes I smile. I'm a happy guy. But the disease brings me too much dissatisfaction, too much sadness. Art is an escape mechanism. I use art as a remedy. For more than 10 years, Edson has been a patient at psychosocial care centers of the Public Health Network in the city of São Bernardo do Campo, São Paulo State. Educator Sueli Bonfim guides the patients. To her, when people really listen to them, they tell stories. Art has to be something from inside to outside. It can't be like something that has to have a theme. It isn't. Art is what you want it to be. Individual work is built within this freedom. This is another initiative in the city of Rio de Janeiro. It was created in an old colony, a place where people considered unwanted were sent to live. Today, the place is collectively managed by 10 artists, some of whom have attended the colony's psychiatric center. The cultural and artistic means were fundamental to the psychiatric reform and continue to be essential to breaking the stigmas around the idea, the notion of what is madness, of what is psychiatric suffering. In the 80s, the psychiatric reform began to extinguish the dark model of asylums and introduced psychosocial care in the country. The movement to change the inhuman treatment based on electroshock, imprisonment, torture and exclusion of the patients defended to treat through art. It was what Nisi da Silveira, the psychiatrist who headed the movement, thought. Before, I only painted landscapes, horses and butterflies. I used to paint in a more academic way. When I started attending psychosocial care centers, I began to make works more focused on the human psyche, on dreams. Something more focused on the mind, on the superego, that psychologic stuff. Plain banana is a super versatile ingredient that can be used in both in sweet and salty dishes. Let's check out a recipe for salted that is a great accompaniment for rice and beans. Today's recipe is, once again, with these muses from Paradise, the dear bananas. I'm going to make a sauteed with them, which is always a success. To know if a plantain banana is good, we look to its peel. When it is light yellow, it means that it is almost ripe. The darker it gets, the riper it is. They are all sweet about to eat, depending on your choice, more or less sweet. Today I'm going to use almost ripe bananas. They are yellowish and firm. They are neither sweet nor neutral in taste, tasting like potato or manioc. Braise the onion into cilantro stems or it can be parsley stems. Add a pinch of salt. Add the sliced garlic and braise it to pass on the taste. Add the diced tomato and braise it. Then you're gonna add the diced banana and mix the ingredients well. Pour water into it and let it boil. Turn down the heat and cover the pan. Let it boil for 5 minutes or until the banana is cooked. 
Taste it to check if it has enough salt. If necessary, add more salt. And now comes the special touch. The special touch of this recipe is the lemon zest. Lemon and banana are a perfect match. By the way, there is a delicious Swiss lemonade recipe with ripe banana instead of sugar. Try it! Add the lemon zest and let it cook for more one minute. Finish the dish with a lot of fresh or dry pepper. You can add a handful of parsley, chive and cilantro. Did you like the show? So hit the like button and share with your friends. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel to receive notifications. We'll see you next week.